And I work on designing graphene nanopores to sequence DNA at a single molecular level. So the idea of DNA sequencing is to read the content of your genome. And what you want is a recorder that can read the sequence of your DNA, but for that you need a recorder that is not bigger than the size of a single base. So we are using graphene because graphene is only one atom thin, so we are really doing high technology with very simple methods. So we take a piece of graphite here, we put the graphite onto the scotch tape, we extrude it once, we take a silicon wafer here, in which that we bring into contact with the graphene, we press hard, we end up with a piece of wafer that somewhere has a graphene layer. And then we bring that chip to a transmission electron microscope to burn a nanopore into it. Uh, so then we take this chip, we flow on both sides a buffer, and on one side we inject the DNA molecule, and that's what we can record. There are still a few challenges to overcome, but all the technology I mentioned is in the size of this little chip here that could be used uh, by a physician in his office to sequence the DNA of one of his patients in only a few minutes rather than a few days. Okay, so now you understand, right, what graphene has the capability of doing. Now the only way it would be able to go near your DNA is if, you know, it's like inside your body, right? Okay, so let's look at what graphene has the ability to actually do. We think of copper as being a very electrically conductive material, but graphene conducts electricity even better than copper. The reason that graphene conducts electricity so well is that the electrons can move fantastically fast. This gives graphene limitless applications including conductive paints and inks, faster next-generation electronics, high-frequency devices, and more efficient batteries. We were working on experiments that we hadn't even thought of 10 years ago, even five years ago. Graphene throws in all sorts of new challenges for completely new types of, of science to do. It's hard to think of another type of material in which you would have those sort of challenges thrown up on a, a weekly, almost daily basis. That's what's really exciting about graphene. Graphene was first isolated and any of its properties were first identified by scientists working in the physics department at Manchester from 2004 onwards. What's happened over the last decade is there's been a big expansion of graphene work into my own department, which is chemistry, into material science, into the life sciences and into engineering. We could have batteries and supercapacitors that are bendable and therefore, because graphene doesn't break, or, or it's very hard to break graphene, and therefore could be stored into, for example, fabric, so you could store the energy within, or have the energy storage device sewn into your clothes, where you could have some graphene-based energy storage device that might even be in fact, effectively sewn into somebody's skin. You can imagine that's, that's science fiction, but I can't see why that wouldn't happen in the future. In fact, effectively sewn into somebody's skin. You can imagine that's, that's science fiction, but I can't see why that wouldn't happen in the future. Okay, so now you see what it has the ability to do, right? It's not a shock. Well, it is a shock, but it has to do with what you're seeing there in these videos, right? I can't say much more than what you see and what I just showed you, but you heard even out of the one guy's mouth about making sure, you know, getting it to your clothes. Well, what's the next step? He says, I can imagine a future where it's even on your skin, right? Which would likely be this thing called Mark. And I'm not talking about Mark Jacobs, okay? I'm talking about a Mark, which is going to be sooner than later in, a, in you know, tied in with all of this stuff that's actually happening. Now, this is graphene. This clip here is important to see about graphene and what the potential graphene has as far as connecting to, I don't know, this, like, thing that's going on with, like, our phones and stuff. You know, like, connecting humans and, you know, your, your phones and even your, your brain. This is the hexagonal lattice of carbon atoms called graphene. 
is single atom thick, but stronger than steel. It conducts electricity and heat efficiently and has been slowly realizing its potential as a game changer. Kostya Novoselov, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on graphene, says one great application is in communications because graphene is completely transparent and can transmit information via optical circuits incredibly quickly and efficiently. It just allows you to push the signal processing into the optical domain and honestly I don't think any other material apart from graphene can, can do the same, can change its optical state at the, at, at, at the same pace. So I think that's probably one of the most exciting and at the same time realistic applications. Lightweight graphene can be easily incorporated into everything from shoes to clothing to cars and that will make them strong, flexible and smart. And its ability to move information quickly is going to be part of what makes the super fast 5G networks that are coming soon possible. We started to see it first in composite material applications, in sport goods, now it goes into, into advanced cars, but now we already start to see it being used for electronics, for printed electronics, and I think it, 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 just, um, uh, it, it just develops with a very good pace for, uh, for a new material. Graphene is also making more efficient solar panels possible, and it's making smart electronics smarter and faster. But graphene might even soon be making people better. I think we will see more interesting applications like applications in biotechnology, maybe in membrane technology. So those are quite, are quite exciting, but they need a little bit more time to, to mature. Novoselov says graphene circuits are so sensitive an atom-thin probe can read and map brain activity and send that information to doctors or a phone in case of medical emergency. Boy, that was really interesting, right? Because that's exactly what we all need. We want to be connected to our phones, connected to this network, so to speak. But that's what they want, and that's what they're doing. And that is exactly why they've been pushing transhumanism. This is why they've been pushing, oh, living forever, immortality with superheroes and all that stuff. This has been what it's always been about for them. And the Bible speaks of this when men in the end times, they, many are going to seek death and not be able to find death because they're not going to be human anymore. Because once you manipulate this certain code in your body, well, you're not. And how would they be able to do that? You'd have to be able to get something inside of you. I couldn't think of what in the world they could possibly be trying to get inside people right now so desperately. But that would be the neat thing, right? And then let's finish it here with the World Economic Forum. Because this is the do-all end all, right? The World Economic Forum, I showed you the clips with the next wave here, the fourth industrial revolution what they want and how they want technology inside the body mixed with humans. Well, this is them talking about 5G. The first thing about 5G is it's an opportunity for transformation. These technologies will form the world of the future. We cannot afford to be written out of that future. You have to keep in mind that more or less everything will change. We as an industry classify 5G as better speeds, lower latency, and the ability to connect the very large number of devices that are suited for very high-end applications. Some of the applications that are likely to come from 5G, autonomous driving, developments in the healthcare area, smart cities, manufacturing, energy. The 4G technology is connecting people. The 5G technology will be connecting objects. When we talk about global connectivity, the relevant measure would be the number of connected devices. If there's roughly 20 billion connected devices today, it's projected globally there will be 50 billion connected devices by the year 2030 alone. In order to be able to handle all of this traffic, you require a network that is much more flexible, and that's what 5G will bring. It will be machines talking to machines, IoT or Internet of Things. In manufacturing, for example, you can monitor much better all of the machinery that is part of the manufacturing process as well as the logistics. You can start to predict and anticipate where the defects will happen. And as a result, you can improve the efficiency that can translate into billions of dollars of savings for the industry. Just imagine a new scenario where everything is connected. Do we need traffic lights? We don't need traffic lights. You just speak and say, I'm going home. The network knows where your home is. The network knows where all the cars and the traffic is. 
The result of that ends up being reduced energy consumption, reduced carbon footprint. For many years, environmental policy relied on educated guesses and hunches. There wasn't really a very strong evidence base. And so this is where I think technology can help us far outpace what we've been doing in the past. What 5G will open up is this instrumentation and transportation of data that could really take healthcare to a completely new level. Right now, if someone's having a heart attack, there's no way of sensing that. 5G and beyond will allow the early detection well before you even feel the symptoms. 5G is going to underpin the digital economy in many countries. And that's why it's really important that we get these enabling conditions right. But I think we have a behavioral issue that we need to address. We spend a lot of time engaged with our devices to the extent that we're looking at how do we actually make people look up when they cross the road. There's one thing about being a smart city. The other challenge is, do you use this technology well? Does it make us happier people? Do we use the city in a better way? We need to focus on not just the near-term economic benefit for the corporate world, but the societal benefit that 5G will bring. If you put a VR lab in a school, the students can explore the pyramids of Egypt or even the solar system. But on the continent, there are challenges with even basic internet access today. A lot of infrastructure in countries is built by governments in order to attract corporate investment. So governments need to decide what are the infrastructure elements they should be encouraging investment in. 5G gives us the potential to leapfrog into the next generation of connectivity. And I really hope policymakers, tech entrepreneurs, mobile operators, civil society activists pay real attention to making sure that this era of human history really becomes the generation where we close that gap between the rich and poor parts of the world. Now you can piece all of those things together and you see where this is going? Do you understand why this is needed to be in people while you see towers and all these wonderful things going on because we all need faster download speeds so we can download videos quicker and listen to music faster without, you know, that dreaded wheel popping up when the connection isn't strong enough. No, it's not about that. It's always been about connecting humans with this network and 6G is on the cusp and 2030 is right around the corner. It's all happening right now. So I hope by me showing you these things, you're able to piece it together and have an understanding of what they're trying to do and why it's so important to have this in you. And again, like I said earlier in the video, you will either reject this or you'll be mutating with it. And every time you take one of these boost jumps and put that inside of you, there's a chance of either one of those things happening. At some point, your body may flat out reject it, or your body may continue if your immune system is strong enough, if your body is strong enough, however it's going to work inside of your body, it's either going to adapt with it and mutate with it, or it's not. And that's why it's so important for them to constantly keep doing this, and that's why we're living in a human science experiment. And we have these Dr. Frankensteins to thank, who 100 years ago, these people, <laughs> they would be long gone by now, because the people would not have put up with this stuff. Your tax money going towards CERN, going towards all of these ridiculous things so that they could build this type of technology to destroy humanity. Pretty insane, right? But that's the truth of the matter. I hope you're able to figure out and, and your brain was able to process this if you weren't already aware. I know a lot of you are aware already. This is just another video so that maybe you could show somebody who's not getting it, whether you, know, you showed them a video and it didn't register or not, maybe this will. And that's why I'm going to constantly keep trying to piece things together to try to make it make sense for people out there who don't get it. I understand why people reject this because it sounds like it's straight out of a movie, but it is, unfortunately. But uh, the movie is the actual reality we're living now, and this is what these monsters are doing to humanity. So share this with people. I thank you guys for being here. Hope to see you on the website. I appreciate all of you greatly. God bless you and your families.